Good morning, I'm Jeff Van Karen, and I'll be your lay reader this morning. Please join me in the call to worship. We come from east and west, north and south. United by technology, hearts bound by God's love. Please join me in the invocation. God of new beginnings, new life, new stages in our journey. We thank you for today. We are deeply rooted in you, yet we grow into new possibilities and fruit afresh for your world. We want to produce love, joy, peace, patience, and the rest, so keep us close to you and each other. 
Strengthen us today by your word and sacrament to do your work in the world around us. Amen. The lesson this morning comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 and four, through 47, and can be found on page 5 of the worship bulletin. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and distributed them all, as any had had need. And day by day, attending the temples together and breaking bread in their homes, they partook of food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is a 
wayfaring stranger. The Gospel this morning comes from John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 12, and can be found on page 5 of the Worship Bulletin. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of vine that bears no fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already made clean by the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If a man does not abide in me, he cannot cast forth, forth as a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Good morning. 
morning. I'm so happy to be with you this Sunday and for the next couple of years as we explore this in-between time together. And what's more fitting to start this in-between time than going to the very roots of our faith and tapping into the communion, the Eucharist, the meal that Christ has given us. So let me tell you a story about my first communion. When I was in seventh grade, uh, my family had just started going to church. We were going to the Methodist church because we were Methodists, and of course that's what you did. And um, my mother had had a spiritual awakening by going to a women's Bible study in the neighborhood. And I had as well, I had read Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth. And those of you who remember it might uh, recall how, uh, in my case, it uh, scared the devil out of me. It's a book about the end of the world, as seen through a certain lens, shape up or burn. So uh, we started going to church, and as Easter approached, um, we were coming up on a Good Friday or Monday, Thursday service, it was going to have communion, which would be the first time I'd ever taken communion. Now, uh, I desperately wanted this to be super special, something just special, and special in my context, I'm the oldest of five kids, special meant just for me and not for them. And uh, so, as we approached communion, um, I suggested to mom that maybe, you know, the little ones shouldn't go to the service, or maybe that, you know, they shouldn't take communion until they were old enough to understand it. My mother was a wise woman, and she sniffed out pretty quickly a uh, case of spiritual pride on top of a burgeoning adolescent piety. And um, she said something about, well, maybe we never really do understand it, and she's right about that. But then she hit me with absolutely irrefutable logic. Well, she said, what if we never let people celebrate Christmas until they understood it? that. The whole family celebrated communion. From me to my youngest brother, who would have been oh, about three or four years old at the time. I'm 60 now, and I still don't understand communion. But I can experience it. Because in communion, Christ is present. We call this Holy Communion because it's, it's special. You know, my wanting it to be a special event was a good instinct, even if I wasn't working it out quite right. Um, the core word, holy, means special. It doesn't necessarily mean otherworldly or mystical, you know, woo-woo. It means special. And so we have special places and we have special times and special people and special events and we call those holy. And when we prep a special place for our communion, you know, we have an altar or we have a coffee table or we have a TV tray, but we put the effort into making it special and we get out a good plate and a good cup or you might see a special Dixie cup. It's amazing what you can find in your kitchen. Anything done with intention and care becomes special. And that's the core meaning when we're talking about holy communion. And then as we set it up, we're acting as waiters. And you might recall also that the core meaning of the root of the word deacon, as found in Acts 6, is waiter. The people who waited on the tables to make sure that people who were being ignored somehow in the community meals got their share of the meal. Now throughout the centuries, the ritual has varied wildly. God's church makes it special in lots of ways. I mean, we start with the core actions recorded in Scripture. Jesus taking, breaking, Blessing, 
serving. And then it expands in every direction. And you can have a Verdi Mass. You can have drumming and dancing. You can have just the quiet of a church camp, prayer, and a sharing of elements. The way it ends up ritualized varies throughout the world and throughout the cultures, but in all of these cases, Christ is present. And since communion functions in the realm of symbol rather than logic, our participating isn't limited by understanding it. Symbols carry meanings that in ways that words do not. Um, it's not to say that there haven't been plenty of books written about communion, people trying to explain it. But that root is a symbol. And what you bring to the symbol, and how you interact with the symbol, depends so much on your own personal experience with the church, with communion, with God, that every, for every person it ends up being different. I've been in services where I could not understand a word. I remember a service at a little church in Austria, and my one year of high school German was not cutting it. But when they broke the bread and poured the wine and served it, and I ate it, I knew Christ was present. At its best, communion welcomes everybody through the world. Even in those traditions where communion is uh, limited or closed and allowed, at least by the rules, only to the baptized or confirmed in that church, oftentimes you find that the rules get bent and broken. Three years ago, I was worshiping at a Syriac Orthodox church in Jerusalem. The entire service was in Aramaic, and the only word in Aramaic I know is Abba. Jesus' word for Father. And they did use that. Oh, they said a word I know. <laughs> As it came time for communion, I was sitting in the very back row, back there with you all, and I was sitting in the very back, and I was just going to stay in my place. I knew the tradition that this was a church that only served communion to its own people. But the deacon who worked at the center that I was studying at, he was up there assisting the priest, and he was holding the bread and wine, and he looked back, and he caught my eye, and he started nodding. Get in line, get in line. I kind of looked around, and thought a minute, and then thought, he's invited me? Answer the invitation. And so I got in line, I was the very last person in the line, and came up, and the priest kind of gave me a look, but he served me communion. I did not look like the Arab Syriacs, who was everybody else in the congregation. But he served me, and Christ was present. It doesn't matter how big of a group it is. Some of the earliest pictures of the Eucharist are wall paintings in Rome's catacombs, showing family groups crammed into tiny little rooms, huddled around a table hiding the persecution going on above ground, and Christ was present. It doesn't matter where on earth it is, or beyond the earth. During the Apollo 11 space flight, during a rest period between, before their first lunar walk, Buzz Aldrin quietly took a little communion kit that he'd been given by his Presbyterian church on earth, and poured the wine, and broke the bread, and read scripture, and took communion. He'd asked the crews on the ground to observe radio silence, not necessarily to participate, just to give them the space to do it. He said that it was very strange that when he poured the wine in the one-fifth gravity of the moon, the wine just kind of slowly trickled into the cup. And yet, Christ was present. It doesn't matter how fancy or elaborate the elements are. In Nazi concentration camps, ministers would sneak 
crumbs of bread out of the meal, and then hiding in the back of the barracks would serve communion of bread and water, because they're absolutely, certainly no wine, bread and water of crumbs to the people hiding and huddling. And yet, there, Christ was present. During the heights of the Cultural Revolution in Communist China, when any religious act, Christian or Buddhist or Muslim or Confucian, was strictly forbidden, Christians would raise their rice cake and simply say, I remember words that were too dangerous to say out loud, and yet they would say that. Do this in remembrance of me, Christ had said. They remembered, and Christ was present. In our time of worldwide pandemic, when we're scattered to homes and offices, classrooms and kitchens, in front of a computer monitor or a television or a tablet or a phone, in these times, God's people are still celebrating this sacrament. You're using whatever you've got for bread. No need for a special wafer baked by nuns and stamped with IHS, that's a monogram for the name of Jesus. You know, Jesus used the ordinary bread from his meals. Maybe it was something like a pita bread, or it was maybe more like a cracker or matzo, since it was Passover. And so if it's artisan multigrain, or wonder bread, or a piece of muffin, or a bagel, a tortilla, or a rice cube. Use what you have. Likewise, Jesus used the ordinary dinner wine of his people. The church has found souls with many beverages from many different traditions. Unfermented grape juice, fruit juice, even water. Jesus used what he had. So you use what you have. God is Lord of creation and everything in it. Use it with thanksgiving, and Christ will be there. Communion, with all of its symbolism, is one of the most special things that the church does. And we do it in so many ways and places with different elements that sometimes it seems a little chaotic. But in every case, we are remembering the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And we recall that he gave that meal to everybody, even to Judas, who then took off to betray him. Jesus is present at every table, scattered throughout the city. Jesus is present in every congregation that gathers to celebrate. Jesus is present every time you say, I remember, I remember. We're given a special gift. Come, let us use it well. What prayer requests would you like to share this morning? I'd invite you to stand and tell us your name and speak aloud the request. You'll find also quite a number of prayer requests printed in your bulletin. Anyone would like to share anything? Okay, well. A little music, and then we will move into the pastoral prayer.
Gracious and loving God, we come to you this morning with full hearts, knowing how complicated these times are, seeing conflict in our communities, that we might find ourselves on one side or another of them, seeing people falling ill to a virus, falling ill to fear, falling ill to denial, and not quite knowing what to do. We see an economy that seems to be going up and down at the same time. We hear friends, or maybe ourselves, who have lost jobs, and yet others who are finding new ones. And in all this confusion, we turn our hearts to you, knowing that you are the solid rock, the one who is always with us, the one who cuts through the chaos and draws us ever closer to the eternal rest that you provide. And so, gracious one, we lift up to you all our divergent needs, friends who are ill, our own illnesses, the conflicts in our community, the conflicts in our heart, places where relationships have been broken and friendships have been strained. And we ask you that there would be forgiveness and healing and reconciliation. We give you thanks, O oh God, knowing that in all of this wildness, you carry us through, and you sustain us, and you nurture us. And so we come together through our computers, through our screens, through our phones, and even in these pews. And we join together saying the prayer that Jesus taught us to say, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. During these difficult times, we are still called to do God's work, and the church is called to do God's mission. And we can't do that without the generous gifts of our congregation and those that we reach out to through these multiple uh, medium, whether it be the computer or Facebook. Um, and if you are so inclined to give, we ask you to um, utilize our church address or go to rcfirstucc.com and click on the giving tab. Thank you. And I know that you computer geniuses have it so you can just do it in two or three keystrokes. So probably you've already got the offering collected. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh God, for your great generosity to us. You have blessed us more than so many peoples in the whole world. And so we take this time to give back to you and to your work and to your mission in the world a bit of what you have blessed us with. Use this well. Help us to use this well, that we might further your ministry throughout our community. In Christ's name, amen.
I would have you note that we've got a variety of communion elements today because I know you're using a variety of communion elements in your home. So whether tortillas or sandwich bread, another tortilla, a loaf, whatever it is, use it with intention and with care. And Christ is present with you as we celebrate this meal. And for the congregation, we invited them to pick up individual glasses of wine or juice and individual pieces of bread in the narthex, bring them in, stow them in the little containers in their pew until this time. And so I'd invite you to, at the appropriate times, to um, get out the pieces and then follow along with the action as I bless the raise the bread, bless the bread, raise it yourselves and bless it yourselves and pray on it and take it. And so, join me now in our communion service. Christ promises to be with us always. So we join in him and believers everywhere sharing our soul with him. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for the wonders of your, your creation. From primordial singularity, you made the universe into being. Its vastness and complexity stir wonder and awe in us and lead us to seek you. Even when we turned in upon ourselves, thinking that we could live without you, you did not leave us alone. You came to us through the law, the prophets, and ultimately in Jesus. His life, death, and resurrection brought us back into fellowship with you, and being with you, found ourselves in fellowship with one another. We praise you, we thank you, and we love you.
We remember that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he sat at table with us and he took bread. And he take the bread and he thanked God for it. And he broke it and he served it to us and he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this to remember me. similar way he took the cup you can take your cup and he blessed it and thanked God for it and he served it to us as well and said drink from this all of you this cup is a new covenant made through my blood for you and for everyone for the forgiveness of sins whenever you drink this drink this to remember me Let us pray together. Loving and gracious God, thank you for this holy meal. Thank you for connecting us with your people in our church and throughout the world through this blessing. Use it to strengthen our hearts and faith that we may ever love all your people. Amen. Just uh, so everybody knows that the church phones have been forwarded to the uh, administrative colleagues, so if you do need anything, please feel free to call the church phone number, and somebody will answer you. And we also have set up an email for Pastor Mark. Um, it is markucc at rushmore.com. Again, that's markucc at rushmore.com. Very similar to all the other church emails addressed. Please feel free to reach out to Mark and, and with any of your concerns or questions. And he is as enthused as getting to know you as we are of getting to know him.
wherever you are in the world, know that you are in the world loved by God who created you, created by Christ who redeemed you, and empowered by the Holy Spirit who sustains you through everything. Go in peace to love and serve God.